Hello everybody, I am Jared Rossagini Vlogger, and on today's vlog, I will be looking into Matt Baker's 18th century immigrant ancestors to Nova Scotia. <laughs> Last episode, we looked into the maternal line of Matt's third great grandmother, Eunice Besenson. So, today we're going to switch our focus to Eunice's paternal line, the Besenson or Bazanson family. Here we have what we've built so far of Matt's family tree. So, today we're going to focus on George Bazanson. And if you notice, there are no hints here. Pulling up his profile, the only source of information we have just on him existing is from this North America Family Histories 1500 to 2000 collection. But this actually comes from the book Genealogy of the Descendants of John White of Wenham and Lancaster, Massachusetts, 1638 to 1900. And this book has been very vital in what we've built so far. And in the last few episodes, I used that to help build out the family. And I had a few comments about you shouldn't treat family histories found in books as fact. You need to treat them just like if you found a family tree online. You would need to verify it. And those people are correct. I should just say that on these episodes, a lot of the time, I need to focus only on a little bit of the records because I can't show every single thing doing to correlate it because then these things would be an hour long and... That would just be crazy. But I do want to take this moment to say that, yes, if you are on any sort of family tree website or you're looking through any sort of books, you're in the library, anywhere, and you find books with family histories that's linking your family to other stuff, you need to look at the citations of the book. You need to try to correlate other records to the book. And you need to do more if you really want to verify it. Although I'm sure there are a lot of people watching these videos who aren't really into genealogy research. And that's really where they get their source of information. They read the books and they kind of just say, okay, well, this is what I know, and it comes from this author. It really isn't a bad way to treat it, honestly, but if you are doing actual genealogy research and trying to expand the family tree and build these family narratives, you do want to look further into it. But going to this image to see what do they even tell us about George, we see that really they don't say anything. We just see that Mary Millet married on April 4th, 1805, George Besenson, and they lived in Chester. Beyond that, we only just get his children, Eunice, Hannah, George, Nathaniel, and Charles. The others coming from Mary's first husband who had drowned as mentioned here in the book. Now, since we had no hints, the next step is to do a search. Basically, we just look up George Besenson. We know Mary's birth year, which is 1776. So we'd probably set it 1776 plus or minus 10 years. And then we can set it in Nova Scotia specifically because we know that's where they were. And when we do a search with that, it turns up two things. We have a family tree which is under the name Hanley Quest for Jean George Bazanson, which does list spouse Mary Millet Vaughn, so that's matching up. And then birth dates do make sense with what we know. We also get here public member photos and scan photos Jean George Bazanson, birth May 16, 1781, death June 10, 1804. When we pull this up, we see that it's the heirs of Jean George Bazanson. But on the document, it only says heirs of George Bazanson, so it is correlating with that name and we see Eunice listed at the top so we know that this is definitely the person we're looking for but it's not giving us anything new on George beyond just confirming all of his children so when we look at what's in this Hanley Quest profile we see there's four facts connected we have 1861 census of Canada and this is listing a John Bazanson so we look at that document and this is going to be a document where it's a census that does not list all of the names of the family. It just lists the number of people within the family that fall within the certain categories. So when we scroll down, we can find John Bazanson, but this doesn't do anything to correlate with us that this is the correct person that we're looking for. And so we see John Bazanson right here. So seven people total in the household in 1861. The other record, other family trees by other people which aren't listed. This tree also connects the book which is in the North America Family Histories collection. And then we also have Nova Scotia, Canada, Census, Assessment and Poll Taxes. And here it's listed again as John Bazanson, Residence 1838. Trying to view the record. 
we don't really get anything, but we do get a link to the Nova Scotia Archives website. So let's go ahead and hop on over there. Now, unfortunately, it takes us to the wrong page connected to somebody else, this George Duncan. And going through, we see it's not here. But even so, we can just go over to the right, click Census Assessment and Poll Tax Records, since we know he'll be in here, and we just do a quick search, John Bazanson. And there we go, there's actually two, one in Westchester, one in Falmouth Township. We know ours was in Westchester. So when we take a look, we see the list of people, and going through, we see John Bazanson right there, farmer. But since it's just listing John Bazanson, still we're not sure if this is truly are John Bazanson. It's possible there were others living in the area at the time, even though we're not really finding records on them. It's still possible. At the same time, we know our ancestor is George. We've seen the John name, but we haven't found anything to actually correlate that. And so then from searching within genealogical websites, I decided to do my typical of, let's do a Google search. And in doing a Google search, I was able to find this page. This page comes from bazansons.com, and this is a page for George directly. So we see the birth, May 16th, 1781, which does correlate with that Hanley Quest tree. We see died after 7 June 1821, which doesn't really correlate with what we saw because that actually had his death date listed as 1881, which if true, that means that he would have lived to have been just about 100 or over 100. And then we get his parents, Jean-Jacques Jacob, Bazanson and Anne Maria Lay. And it even gives us this little paragraph George Bazanson was also known as Jean George. He was born on 16 May 1781. And then notice here we have a citation and we have seven different citations listed at the bottom. We see he was baptized on 24th of May 1781 in Lunenburg. So, so eight days old when he was baptized. He married Mary Millet on 10 June 1804 at Chester, Nova Scotia. He was 23, she was 28. The ceremony was performed by Reverend Joseph Dimmick, and we see four different citations for that. George Bezenson probably died after 7 June 1821, and that citation comes down here where it says John Cardinal Assumption based on the birth date of his last child. And this is something that you'll commonly see in different genealogical websites or trees or whatnot, is genealogists won't have any records on someone, they won't have a death record specifically, so there has to be some sort of assumed date based on records. So you usually will use the last record that indicates that they were alive. And then the next record that indicates that they were dead. So let's say maybe a census of the same family where, you know, 1860 he's there, but then 1870 he's gone. Well, then that would indicate he died sometime in between 1860 and 1870, but maybe there's some record of him in 1863, so then you know it's between 1863 and 1870. So here, the assumption is basically the last child was born June 7th, 1821. He was likely alive for that child's birth. I don't know if there's anything to indicate that, because technically he just had to be alive for the child's conception. But looking at all of these citations, we see a lot of them indicate this Dorothy Evans Bazansons from Nova Scotia book. And then we have a few other things listed as well. Lunenburg County Gen Web Project, Chester Township Book of Marriages. We have John Wesley Houghton, the Houghton Genealogy of 1912. And then we have Georgie Levy, Diary of Joseph Dimmick, and where the groom's name is George Bazantson and the bride's name is Mary Vaughn. Now, before we look into that Dorothy Evans book, Bazansons from Nova Scotia, let's look at some of these other citations. So first, looking at this citation, Lunenburg County Gen Web Project, Chester Township Book of Marriages, we see it says George's surname is spelled Bazanson. So quick Google search of Chester Township Marriages, and I was able to find this. We just do a quick search Bazanson, and hey, there we go. George Bazanson and the widow Mary Vaughn were legally joined in marriage on the 10th day of June, 1804. Recorded December 20th, 1804, Ebenezer Fitch, town clerk. Then we see this John Wesley Houghton, Houghton Genealogy of 1912. Quick Google search shows that it's actually on open library, so we could just go ahead and read the whole thing. So we pull it up, do a quick search, 
Bizantin. We see a few, and hey, there we go. One right off the bat, and it shows the marriage between Mary and George. Then we go to the next one, Georgie Levy, Diary of Joseph Dimmick, page 116, where the groom's name is George Bizantin, and the bride's name is Mary Vaughn. Well, a quick search of that turns it up actually on the family search library. All we have to do is view inside and then go to page 116. So here we're at page 116, and look there, George Bizantin was married to Mary Vaughn, June 10th, 1804. Right there, we've gone through three citations real quickly. And then we also have this Dorothy Evans Bizantins from Nova Scotia. And that's the book that really the majority of this website's based off of, but I'm gonna jump into that in a little bit. First, we're gonna go and look at George's father. So at the page, as we mentioned, we have his father, Jean-Jacques Jacobs Bizantin. We click that and it takes us to his page. And this page is long and it has a lot of information. And a big part of this has to do with the fact that Jean-Jacques was a really interesting person, but there was also a lot of information transcribed in here, including his will. So here we see Jean-Jacques Jacob Bizantin's will dated 20th May, 1800. Gives us a whole lot of names associated with the will. It looks like his name here in the will is John James Bizantin. Then we see Jean Creighton, judge of probate, executors Anthony Vaughn and Peter Corkum, with Anthony Vaughn, John Prescott, and Joseph Dimmock. And just like any will does, it gives a lot of the family and what they're getting. And we can see the names of all the people in the will are put in bold here on the transcription as well as how they're related. So we have loving wife, Anna Mary, we have son Joseph. We also have sons Alexander, John George, Gideon, John, John Casper, John William, Peter, and Benjamin. And boy did this family love that name John. And that can be a difficult thing when it comes to genealogy because we have all of these family members. There's four siblings who all have the name John in some variation. John George, John, John Casper, John William. So that means that we could find John Bizantin in Chester with the same parents listed, but unless we have something else to truly correlate it to our John, we aren't gonna be able to know if it's ours or another. So like when we looked at the different censuses before, was that our John George? Was that John? Was that John Casper? Was that John William? We don't know. We also see I likewise constitute, make and ordain Mr. Anthony Vaughn and Mr. Peter Corkum of this town to be executors of my last will and testament. And while I'm not 100% sure which Mr. Anthony Vaughn this is, we do know that this is likely a relative of Mary's first husband, James Vaughn, who died from drowning. And then at the bottom, we see John J. Bizantin made his mark. And when we look at this citation, we see Catherine DiPietro Lunenberg will extracts. We can click S233 and we see where it comes from. But this link just takes us to a page which is transcriptions of wills from Lunenberg. So it gives nothing new that's not already on the website here. But notice how John J. Besenson made his mark. It doesn't say that he signed. So if that is the case where he did not sign, he just made a mark like an X or something, that would indicate that he was unable to write and possibly unable to read as well. But that really wasn't uncommon back then. And when we scroll down further, it actually gives us quotes from the Byzantins from Nova Scotia about Jean-Jacques. The career of Jean-Jacques is remarkable. His religious zeal was more than matched by his business acumen. He had no schooling and remained illiterate all his life. Yet the land transactions in his name, all properly drawn up, witnessed and signed with his ex, far outnumber those of any other man in the settlement and make up a large part of book number two of the land records. He also ran a lumber mill and a grist mill, farmed and engaged in shipbuilding. So uneducated, but an absolute entrepreneur, constantly working in all sorts of different industries and seemingly doing quite well. And then we get a look into some of the ancestry for Jean-Jacques and the ancestry for Matt Baker at the same time. His descent was French and probably his mother tongue was also French. But Patterson says the inhabitants of Montbilliard were ethnologically more German than French. They spoke a corrupt dialect of French with a German intonation. In fact, they do not wish to be called French, but speak of themselves as Swiss. But Byzantins, through many generations, insisted on their French heritage, 
it is certain that Jean Jacques spoke German and English as well. So now we're going to look at his father, Jean Georges Bazanson. And this Jean Georges, Jean Jacques' father, is the immigrant ancestor of the Bazanson family. He was born circa 1708 at Etabon Montbelliard, which is located in western France near Switzerland, which is probably why it was mentioned that a lot of people who were part of this would consider themselves Swiss even though they were in France. Jean-Georges Bazanson and his wife Jean with an unknown surname immigrated on the 16th of May 1752 to St. George's Island in Halifax, Nova Scotia aboard the Speedwell. On the passenger list, he is described as 44 years old from Montbilliard and a farmer. Jean-Georges Bazanson became a widower when Jean died either as the Speedwell neared Halifax Harbor or soon thereafter on St. George's Island for she was buried in Halifax. He married Catherine Boutillier, I hope I'm saying that right, on 20th of May 1753 at St. John's Anglican Church in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. She was 29. And towards the bottom of the page, we see this from Elaine Hoare. Jean-Georges Bazanson was among the foreign Protestant settlers who were recruited in Europe to populate the province of Nova Scotia in the 1750s. For almost a year, these settlers were held on George's Island before being settled in Lunenburg. Jean-Georges wrote a lengthy petition to the governor begging him to get us off this godforsaken island. One of the most interesting things which I have yet to substantiate, there is an unproven history which says that he was scalped by Native Americans in his own dooryard in view of his wife who held a babe in her arms. Now knowing that story and looking back at this information that we have, we see that Jean-Georges Bazanson died 1755. We see Jean-Jacques, Matt's ancestor, who was born 1754, and Jean-Jacques' sister Susanna was born 1756. So if that story is true, that means that Matt Baker's ancestor, Jean-Jacques, was being held by his mother as she watched her husband be killed by Native Americans and then scalped. Now, is this true? Obviously, this is unsubstantiated, and even the letter says that unproven history. So it might be one of those things that we'll never know, but it's a pretty interesting story. Now I did my usual where when I find something like this, like a, an amazing website, I will reach out because that person has obviously spent a lot of time looking into this family and has done a lot of research themselves. Even just the time to set up this information and type it all out, even if they didn't do the research, gives them a lot of material to work with because they've literally typed it out. So they've gone through it step by step. Now the website owner is John Cardinal who unfortunately declined to be in this video, but he did tell me, which is also listed on his front page, that the majority of the website is based on the book by Dorothy Evans, who is actually born Dorothy Bazanson. But even though the website was mostly based off of her book, he did use a lot of other sources and has also extended off of her work, putting on as many branches as possible. And one thing that he actually mentioned to me was he did not have Matt's branch. So being able to supply him with that part added a whole new branch onto the family for him. Now, John does mention that he does descend from the Bazanson family. And while I won't say exactly how he connects, he also descends from George Bazanson and Mary Millett. But the story of John George Bazanson being a foreign Protestant and these people being brought to Nova Scotia in the 1750s really intrigued me and I wanted to learn more. So I decided that I wanted to reach out to one of my genealogy friends who's from Nova Scotia, and that is Brian Nash, who runs the YouTube channel, How We Got Here. Hi, my name is Brian Nash. I have, I'm from Nova Scotia for, well, not by birth, but my, my family's parents were both from there and I grew up a majority of my life there. I have a YouTube channel about genealogy and I have a podcast called How We Got Here, which is the same name as the YouTube channel where, and the podcast, I specifically talk more about Atlantic Canadian genealogy and local history. The foreign Protestants, is, that's generally referred to, well, there's a couple groups of people that kind of make up that um they're the pre-revolutionary war ones they're called new england planters which generally people from massachusetts area mostly and, and new hampshire as well but I've, i think they're 
there still is kind of a, even in the 20th century, there's still a lot of going back and forth between New England and the Atlantic Canada. There's those foreign Protestants, which would have been um, basic people that would have came here for land. So they were trying to, they had a lot of different land grants. Uh, then you have a, a group of foreign Protestants that would be sort of that post Revolutionary War. Some of them were loyalists. Some of them were, for instance, uh, there's a large population, especially in the Lunenburg area of Hessians, the German soldiers that had fought for the British uh, during the American Revolution, who wouldn't be the foreign Protestants, would be the majority of Nova Scotia, would be Scottish uh, and some Irish with a little bit of English settlers. But they weren't necessarily there. Um, a lot of these foreign Protestants, one of the things that really encouraged the English to bring them here was they also were, had a lot of missionary work of the Church of England. So you'll see a lot of in Church of England's in a lot of areas, you'll see a lot of um, Germanic names as well, like that were ministers or founders. A lot of those foreign Protestants that they took over, that they came, that were came before the Revolutionary War, besides the New England planter story, there was this group that was from basically along a river basin in Germany that the, the English basically recruited Protestants. So you had Huguenots. They also brought some Dutch people to, that would be Dutch Reform and, and German Reform Lutherans that, that came there. And they were they came specifically to help. They, they gave them land grants because they made them swear an oath to the the king and they were Protestant. The original indigenous population were the, the Mi'kmaq Indians or uh, Mi'kmaq tribes. They were the, the people who lived in the land when the Europeans came here. The French were initially the, the first settlers. The French were really predominantly in Atlantic Canada. They, up until the, the late, the mid 1700s, um, were pretty entrenched. There was periods where places went back and forth. The big turning point where um, between the, the British and the, the, the French was in Louisbourg in 1759, which was shortly before the Battle of Quebec. There's uh, groups of them that did stay. Um, part of their, their, their staying, um, they had to swear loyalty to the king. Um, and as much as you know, as much as they swore loyalty, the, the British were always uneasy with that. Um, they they had suspicions that if the the French were ever to come back, that they would be they knew whose side they would, which is one of the reasons they really were trying to encourage settlement. You know, they once populated with people that would go to the Church of England, um, so that was a big motivation for a lot of those people there, and a lot of them were facing persecution in their own in their own countries at the times. So that's why they had sort of gathered in some of these communities in Germany as well. So they they were looking to, to get out. Interestingly enough, Brian actually does have a connection to this family because his wife is a Byzantine descendant. So the Byzantine family, they were part of the this foreign Protestant movement. And then your your wife is a descendant as well. So she's yeah, my, cousin to my, Matt Baker. My wife's uh, grandmother was... Uh, my wife's grandmother's mother was a Byzantine. So my wife's great grandmother was a Byzantine. There's a really good book. I don't know if you uh, saw Winfred Bell's book on the foreign Protestants. There, he actually has not just a um, a book about them, but he actually has indexes of all the different families. the The initial Byzantine was John, Jean George um, Byzantine. Or and again, I'm probably saying it wrong because I don't speak proper French, but that's the way his name would have gotten anglicized. Yeah. Um, and, and that is why a lot of some of the pronunciations are are bad. Uh, they, you know, just they really tried to anglicize, especially a lot of the ones that had French sounding names. And one thing we also discussed were the ships that brought these foreign Protestants over. As we well know, John George is listed as coming on the Speedwell in 1752. In 1751, there was like four ships that came over. Uh, the Speedwell was one of them. The Gale, the Pearl, the Murdoch. Yeah, it, there were, the Speedwell came twice, I think. It's 1751 and 1752. Most of these left port, I believe, from uh, Amsterdam, from what we call the Netherlands. They, uh, 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 for some reason, I'm thinking one of them left from Rotterdam, maybe two of them. When they arrived here, there was there was some some difficulty there. Issues with the what was expected in the of them and what they wound up getting generally referred to those ships in a lot of the 
the information when you read about them is they were human cargo ships, I guess. Sounds kind of rough, but um, they were transport ships. And not all of them were from there, but most of them were from the Montbelliard. Um, there were Swiss and Germans. And you, and you got to think at this point, they still called it America. Um, yeah. You know, they were um, arriving in British North America, which uh, Canada was uh, part of until well, even after uh, we uh, Confederation, in fact, our acts of Confederation was called the British North American Act. It'd be very similar to what they would have been doing to recruit people to live in New England at that point. Um, except because there was still a lot of Acadians, even though they did swore loyalty to the crown, they were they were Catholics and they were trying to get good Protestants into the to Nova Scotia to populate it. Brian also helped explain to me Nova Scotia's relation to the British colonies, what many in the U.S. would call the 13 colonies, both before and after the American Revolution. It's a it's a really kind of an interesting um, community. One of the things that a lot of people don't know, know about Nova Scotia is that they were originally invited to the Cong the uh, the Continental Congress. <clears throat> they didn't attend. They would have been the 14th colony. History could have actually changed quite a bit if they they would have um, they would have participated. They were they still consider themselves very much British British subjects. And in fact, up until um, 2003 or 2004, if you were a British subject and you lived in Nova Scotia, you were entitled to vote in their elections. So there was still that strong strong connection to. The, the motherland. Now, John George Bizanson is Matt Baker's sixth great grandfather, which makes Jean Jacques his fifth great grandfather. And since we know Matt has done through lines, and through lines allows up to a fifth great grandparent to correlate with other descendants, I wanted to take a look and see. Was it picking up on any other descendants of Jean-Jacques, especially through any of George's siblings? And here's that through lines page. We see Jean-Jacques Bazanson, fifth great grandfather, 1754 to 1806. Jean-George Bazanson, 1781 to 1881, which we know that 1881 is incorrect. And this is a good spot to just say that not everything you see in through lines is correct. This is just ancestry guessing based on the DNA and what people supply in the trees. But we see 41 DNA matches just from Jean George, one of those being Matt. And then we see also 23 from Joseph Bazanson, 65 from Alexander Bazanson, six from Gideon Bazanson, two from Mary Ann Bazanson, four from Jean Bazanson, six from Jean W. Bazanson, four from Peter Bazanson, Two from Benjamin Byzantine. So this is really good correlating information. But I should say this doesn't confirm it for sure. Like I said, this is all based on what people are putting on ancestry. So if someone just took a guess and said, oh, well, my ancestor must be one of Jean-Jacques' children, and they put that in there, well, ancestry may pick that up. So these people may accidentally list Jean-Jacques as an ancestor, even though he's not really their ancestor but they're related to Matt through some other line. And so Ancestry sees, well, they share DNA. They also share this in their family tree. So that must be where it's through. So you've got to understand the context of where this information is coming, but it is certainly a great correlation tool and a great tool to really look further. But as we've seen through our research, once we get back this far, sources get scarce. It gets really difficult to be able to find things, it gets even more difficult to be able to correlate things because they're not always listing all of this information to tell you, oh yeah, it's this John Bazanson, not John George Bazanson, it's John Casper Bazanson. Well, it's not always saying that. A lot of times it's just John. So we don't really know. And it just makes things really difficult. Now, one interesting aside I do want to say about the Bazanson family is when I first started researching the tree, I realized that that name seemed familiar. And then I realized I knew this name because years back, I was a big fan of Trailer Park Boys. Although I really still am a fan of Trailer Park Boys. And being a genealogist, as many genealogists know, when you really enjoy something and you like the actors and the people that are a part of stuff, you try to figure out where they came from in their family history because it's just the, such an interesting way to look at history. So I had built out the family trees of some of the actors from Trailer Park Boys and lo and behold, John Francis Dunsworth is a descendant of the Bazanson family. Now that's it for today's episode. 
But on the next episode, we will be looking into Matt Baker's Jewish ancestors in Nova Scotia.